welcome back. Next we have our panel discussion consisting of amazing women, activists and professionals sharing their moving stories uh, about living in Muslim communities, working in these communities, as well as discussing blasphemies from different angles. Uh, Minzy Vitz uh, couldn't be with us today. She's unwell, so she sent her apologies. Halima Salat wasn't granted her visa from the Netherlands, so she couldn't be with us either. Big boo to the home office. Uh, we, we send them both uh, lots of love from here. Our first speaker in the panel uh, is Nouria Khan. She's a British Pakistani aspiring lawyer and activist who mostly grew up between Saudi Arabia and Dubai. Uh, Nouria has a YouTube channel called Holy, Holy Humanist. Uh, it's a platform dedicated to exploring the dogma of Islam, human rights, freedom, oppression, and the surrounding, surrounding social political issues with a, with a strong emphasis on women's rights. Welcome. Second speaker is Rahila Gupta. She's a journalist, writer, and poet active with South Hall Black Sisters and advocacy and campaigning groups for women escaping domestic violence. Her work about immigration, violence, and patriarchy has appeared in The Guardian, among other papers and magazines. Welcome. Uh, our third speaker is Savin Babutardi. She's a lecturer in psychology at the University of West London. Uh, she conducted her doctoral research at the Univ at City University into how traumatic events are experienced. She has worked with adolescents, adults, and, and older individuals in a variety of mental health settings. She worked for eight years as a counseling psychologist <coughs> at the Iranian and Kurdish Women Rights Organization, providing psychological therapy to many women, fleeing, violent, fleeing domestic violence, FGM, and other sorts of uh, domestic violence. Um, Chairing the session is our own Mariam Namazi, uh, <laughs> spokesperson and co-founder of uh, both One Love for All and the Council of Ex-Muslim. Great, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nahla, and thank you guys for being here. It's such a pleasure. This is our first bigger meeting since that horrible COVID pandemic began. And ruined so many lives and uh, it's just great you know we've had online uh, events but there's nothing like this face to face is there so i'm glad we're all here together even though with covid rules there are limits in, in numbers still but at least we get to see each other and um, uh, see our wonderful speakers up front uh, the film a women living islam i i hope you all enjoyed it i think it's a tremendously moving film and uh, we're, I'm going to let you in on a secret. Uh, the, the person who directed it, who edited it, who made it happen, Reason for Freedom, is right here with us, and it's our very own car. <laughs> grateful to him because this is a film that took several years to make actually because all the women who were originally interviewed pulled out for various reasons because they became afraid because they didn't want uh, to be in the film after a while and we had to start all over again and that's why we ended up focusing on activists and of course um, you know it I think it would have been another maybe 10 12 years if it wasn't for Carl and of course Gita Sakya so um, uh, I'm really proud of that work that we've done because I think it highlights so many of the issues uh, that all ex-Muslims face. Um, and I guess uh, to our uh, panelists, I'd like to ask first about the film because I think the film raises so many issues uh, about trauma, about loss, about guilt and grief and honor-related uh, honor sort of um, both violence as well as the, this feeling of, of women and their links with honor, the honor of religion, of, of the men in the family, and so on. So I'd like to get your input first, your general comments on the film, and then we'll move into um, more details on blasphemy. So would anyone like to start or uh, go first? 
Well, I just want to say that I'm so gr grateful that we had a break uh, between the film and the panel because although it was the second time I saw the film, it's, I, it always, I well up, uh, especially with the story of Faye Rahman, it's just impossible not to uh, feel deeply moved by, I mean, deeply moved by all of them. Um, and you know, just that for such uh, what might be considered ordinary freedoms, the kind of uh, <coughs> oppression and fear and anxiety that these women have been through. And, and what really also struck me while I was watching the film was how important an organization like yours is, because that sense of community, I think, you know, I think what you lose, what you, apart from, you know, all the kind of uh, uh, ostracism that uh, comes as a result of leaving Islam, is you lose community. And then something like uh, CEMB provides that sense of community. So it's such an important thing. So that was those were the things that were going through my head. Yeah, I just want to actually echo those same sentiments because I was, again, just as grateful that we had a break because I got teary-eyed at one point because it just comes when you see that everybody is on the verge of leaving Islam, but then almost like this kind of their entire <coughs> life flashes before them before you can make that final dreaded step. And then you know that you may just be like a lone woman fighting this fight and you're going to have to stand up to everyone, even if it was your brother who you were in such good terms with the day before. It's now going to be a whole different war game. And to see people actually live through that and, and stand and go through it and deal with whatever backlash it is that they were to get or in Faye's example, it was a lot more extreme and she had to actually separate from her family. But those sentiments we can all relate to, like, you know, just having to not be able to hang out with your dad in the same way that you would, or hang out with your brothers or your sister, and see them live a life which you've kind of detached yourself from, it just kind of really honed, honed the fact that even in 2021, the fact that you're separating yourself from an ideology like this means you're essentially separating yourself from everything that you know around you. And that is always hard, no matter what time or year we live in. That's just always a hard thing to do, especially as a woman. And it was so nice to see a woman's perspective on dealing with these same emotions, because usually, again, like in everything else in history, this is this seems to be a man's domain and a man's territory. And we seem to be the minority voice within this community. But I think the more of us that come forward like this, and the more stories that we can empathize with, it just kind of really hammers that point home that you are almost standing up against everything you know. And that's really, really hard. Uh, it was my first time watching it, and I thought it was very rich in uh, capturing a variety of different experiences and the journey that an individual goes through. And a journey from uh, where abuse already takes place, which is to reinforce power and control over the individual, the individual's identity, and also the period of uh, questioning within themselves, but not having, not given the environment to debate their beliefs. Because I think a lot of the people also did say and something they experienced in working with a lot of ex-Muslims is you can't question it. If there are any questions around religion, question by itself is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, also the differences in experiences of people in Europe when living Islam versus people where in their countries it's majority of uh, um, the whole country believes in that and the dangers and the challenges that they face. Uh, I mean, one of the things that comes out uh, a lot in the film is the trauma of, of, uh, of it all. And I think uh, the more I live, the more I find that life is primarily trauma, really. And uh, it's sprinkled with a little bit of happiness, you know. But, uh, and, and I know you've done a lot of work on, on trauma, but also you're doing support groups with ex-Muslims. Um, and I wonder how much of what was related here in the film is what you see in your support groups with um, ex-Muslims that you're doing now for, I think it's been over a year now, you've been doing yes. monthly, twice a month now, support groups. I don't think there was anything in the movie that I did not hear people experience that in the support groups. Um, the, I, I think it's very difficult uh, for a lot of people to understand the impact they has on mental health. And we call it trauma, thinking that we understand what trauma is. It's 
or you have something traumatic, it affects you. Trauma is uh, uh, something that impacts the individual's core, the way that they see themselves, make sense of themselves. Uh, it then impacts, uh, uh, impacts every aspect of their life. And the trauma is not just to live, uh, that is, um, it, can, it is traumatic because they live their life as they know it. They, a lot of the people that I work with cannot have any long any contact with their family. Um, they leave their whole life behind. Um, but uh, a lot of the trauma comes also from abuse. Uh, as we saw in the case, there's often a lot of uh, psychological, uh, emotional, verbal and physical abuse that uh, a lot of people uh, do experience, especially in the build-up or if there is any suspicion that they might be planning or that they no longer believe, uh, not even planning to leave the family. And one of the things you mentioned, Nuria, was this thing about women. I think it's interesting because it is something that you see a lot more men, because I guess it's easier for men to be able to leave uh, and disappear in a way, to some extent, because they, they don't have to wear the veil, they don't have the same possible family controls that girls and women do. But a lot of uh, um, ex-Muslims who are very vocal are actually women as well. Do you know what I mean? So it's kind of a contradiction in a way. Uh, Mimsy talked about how it's harder for women and how women face special abuse that's very often linked to, um, you know, just sexual violence or the threat of it. Uh, what do you, do you find that to be the same in your experience and do you find it to be more difficult? Yeah, I think it very much stems from um, kind of what, like what you touched on earlier and the, the, the way that movie touched on it as well is just the fact that the, the, the placement that Islam initially gives women is almost carried over to women who are willing to go that extra step and say, do you know what, here I am, and I'm an ex-Muslim, and I'm gonna stand up and against potentially everything that everybody around me believes in. And where they are more used to, to men exerting their authority or stating their beliefs, it's almost a, a double layer of, I don't know how to explain it, but it's almost like, it's like adding, um, adding like almost salt to the injury if a woman goes that further mile and says, do you know what, this is actually oppressing me, this is oppressing my sisters, this is oppressing every single woman in my family and whether they've internalized it or not, I'm gonna sit here and speak out about it. And again, the easiest way for men to kind of target and attack you is to, to use the kind of sexual, um, you know, a threat, so <coughs> that kind of thing. That's really easy. We are the most easy prime targets for them. Uh, because obviously these men can engage in their kind of like, you know, chest thumping and, and doing whatever they do, whether it's on, you know, in terms of YouTube or whether it's debates at universities or on whatever level. But I think, and this is why I think panels like this are so important and which is why I'm so glad to be here today. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation. It's just because I think when women get together and speak out, that irks them just that little bit more because who better to reach out to women than other women? You know, we're not here to tell you that what you stand for and what you believe in is absolute, you know, sorry, pardon my French, bullshit, but it's actually oppressing you in A, B, and C manner, and we can show you that, and that's all we're doing here. We're not, we're not spewing lies or anything, but they're just so afraid that that connection, uh, if made, is going to wake up so many other women who they need to keep their power and their manipulation tactics kind of in operation. So I think definitely, um, even in 2021, it's so weird to me that we even watch a movie like this and we sit here like this and we're saying that we go through all of this in this day and age, but it just goes to show that even today, when you're trying to shed an ideology like Islam, it penetrates so deep mm -hmm into your culture and into your family systems and everything that you know since you're a child that trying to shed it means almost taking on everybody, whether it's your own family members. Mm -hmm. But also the courage that uh, <coughs> these women showed. I mean, uh, the woman from Saudi Arabia going into Mecca mm -hmm. and you know having the courage to show the words atheist on that camera uh, to all of those <laughs> so men <brave. laughs> uh, and, and women, I presume, I mean, <laughs> hundreds or th I mean, thousands of them. Yeah. I thought that was, that was amazing. I mean, there were just, I mean, even Halima and the FGM story, um, all of them showed just 
so much courage and you have to be extraordinary human beings and that you know that's the tragedy for women that they have to be so extraordinary in order to be ordinary if yeah, you to me. precisely yes. yeah. precisely just to live life on your own terms yeah. essentially yeah. you yeah. have to be an extraordinary <coughs> person yeah go ahead you were going to say something. no it's just about uh, sex uh, sexual violence mm -hmm. i think from a very young age there is the conditions the condition the woman and the girls to almost feel if anything happens to them, they are responsible. Mm -hmm. um, so the way you dress can provoke something, mm -hmm. and therefore the responsibility is never with the perpetrator, aka men. I'm not saying that this is against men, because even for men, things become worse, because men can also be um, sexually abused. That's a different story there. But with women, the whole point of FGM, uh, it is to do with their sexuality. Mm -hmm. It is to oppress their sexuality. So there is an oppression going on from a very young age before they even reach the time when they are forced to uh, wear a scarf. And I say forced because somebody under the age of 18 cannot make a decision for themselves to do that. So it is a cohesion. Um, uh, and uh, if they start from that young age, it's very difficult for that individual then, when they're older, to take that scarf off. And I know because I've worked with women who have left Islam, but they say they find it difficult to take it off because um, they feel naked. Mm -hmm. Now that's because they have been used um, used to wearing it and conditioned from a very young age to have this thing around them. You know, I was thinking on this topic uh, about blasphemous women, how much this fight for women's rights is really an act of blasphemy, you know. And uh, I'd, I'd want to ask you this, Rahila, because you've done a lot of work, you've actually been to Rojava uh, with uh, working with Kurdish fighters and women fighters. And uh, we know also that uh, Daesh uh, was very afraid of being killed by women because they thought that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Anyone else kill them, but not women. And I think this link between um, sort of uh, fighting for rights and by doing so, committing an act of blasphemy, I find that they're very interlinked. Yeah, I mean, before I talk about Rojava, I just wanted to sort of reflect on the different kinds of uh, blasphemous <coughs> women, mm -hmm. if you like. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I would say that somebody like me, I'm not, I'm, I wasn't born a Muslim, I'm born into Islam, but I, I was born into Hinduism. Mm -hmm. um, but I came from a longer tradition of secularism in the sense that my father was a communist. And so women like me who've had uh, a tradition of being secular is very similar to the Rojava experience because we can uh, almost um, label ourselves blasphemous women mm -hmm. as a kind of ironic, we take on the criticism of the mullahs who might call us blasphemous because we can take it almost lightheartedly. Mm -hmm. And then there are the women in this film mm -hmm. and they are the women who are sort of, I feel, half in, half out. They're on the doorstep, you know, they're still, they st even though some of them have gone on to become atheists or ex-Muslim or you know, totally sort of secular, there's still that pull and that's, that's the pain. It's a really deeply embedded pain in the experience of people who are leaving an entire culture, an entire you know, way of thinking uh, behind. Um, and I suppose uh, with the women of uh, Rojava, there, there is, they are supported by an ideological construction which is understood even though they come from, uh, um, they, are, they are technically Muslims, uh, but there is a whole um, liberation revolutionary ideology and their uh, philosopher Abdullah Jalan, their leader who is in prison, uh, his whole theory of patriarchy is based um, partly on the way in which religion was the kind of final coffin in the, you know, uh, where women's rights were concerned, you know, kind of totally entrenching patriarchy in a way that it hadn't been before uh, religion came into the picture. Um, and the third group I just wanted to uh, touch on were, you know, people, so, but, um, are those who don't come from Islam but have felt the impact of Islam. So people like Asya Bibi, 
you know, um, um, and uh, and then also Nadia Murad, who is an Yazidi woman who won the Nobel Prize. And she, uh, I remember going to hear her speak at one event, and she was, I mean, she was, she was weeping almost, you know, for the entire evening, talking about the absolute horror of uh, the kind of rape and, you know, sexual violence that had been visited upon her by ISIS. But, but she almost wept more because ISIS, uh, the Daesh men had called her, uh, you know, a, a Satan, a Satan lover, devil worshipper, because she was still within the religion. If you see, I mean, Yazidi religion isn't uh, uh, Islamic, but it's a mixture of, it's got some uh, elements of Islam, it's got Zoroastrianism, but she was so kind of, like the violation of her faith was almost more painful than the violation of her body, which was a really sort of strange thing. And then there was Asya Bibi, who was a Christian and was accused of blasphemy in Pakistan. She too relates to the values of, Christ of religion. So I think for those sorts of women who are, you know, that half in, half out thing, it's even kind of harder than when you've completely left it behind or you've been brought up like the women of Rojava now, um, they've had this whole entire tradition of, um, well, a whole ideological uh, tradition, and which has translated into uh, the banning of abolition of Sharia um, courts in Rojava, of uh, overturning all um, Sharia principles in relation to inheritance, in relation to custody, in relation to forced marriages, ban, honor crimes obviously are criminalized. And then even really interesting things like uh, if you stop a woman marrying the, the, a man of her choice, that's, that's a criminal offense. You know, it's, it's to that extent, it's the opposite of forced, forcing someone into marriage. So it's just an amazing set of <coughs> the banning of polygamy, etc. And then you were referring, for example, to uh, their, their encounter with Daesh. Uh, the women in the, um, in the forces, the defense forces, play an equal role in terms of leadership with the men. And so they actually used to put themselves in the, uh, you know, the uh, front, the avant, not the avant, the vanguard is the word I'm looking for. Uh, and they would be ululating, so striking terror in the hearts of the Daesh guys, because if they were killed by a woman, they would not go to heaven. So that they were absolutely petrified of being killed by a woman, and their bodies would be left and not buried, be left on the battlefield. So for the women of Rojava, the fight against Daesh was an ideological fight. It was about, it was not just uh, the physical fight, which was also, of course, important. Um, so it's, but, but so that's what I mean, that it's um, because they've already got this sort of tradition and this thinking which is anti-religion, which says religion is something you practice in the home, it's not for the public square. Because they've got that uh, way of thinking, it's sort of not the same relationship with religion that these women have, because they're isolated, they're individuals, they're fighting an individual battle, and so we come back to this idea of why a group is important to provide them with that nurture and nourishment. Um, so yeah, I think, I, I think in some ways the, uh, the Rojava experience, and the other thing I just wanted to quickly add, because I was also thinking about the Afghani women and their fight against uh, Taliban. And I was uh, really interested to hear, so, we, so this is a link we mustn't forget because we can be critical of political Islam, absolutely. But you know, America, and <laughs> that's male power. <laughs> Person for the Solidarity Party of Afghanistan, and she came along. To, she, well, she didn't come along. She joined by Zoom, 
uh, for a session that I'd organized on occupation and religious fundamentalism. And she said something really interesting because, you know, all of us sort of feel, yes, after all, you know, the American invasion in America did actually help with the education of women and gave a few more freedoms and the schools were open, et cetera, et cetera. In Afghanistan. So what did I say? America. <laughs> And, um, and, she, and she said, well, actually, that's complete nonsense because uh, what they did was they educated a few women. They were like show women. They were women who spoke uh, on behalf of American values and ideals. But at the same time, there was a huge amount of girls still not going to school and all of that. So, so the point I simply want to make there, because she feels, and I agree with her, is that American imperialism actually uh, supports, promotes, encourages the development of religious fundamentalist forces. So let's not forget the link that political Islam is also being. Yeah. Um, sorry, am I talking yeah, too no, long? No, no. I'll stop here. Just wanted to make no, that link yeah, between. I think uh, we've seen that in Iran as well, yeah. the link with US foreign policy. Um, but on the issue of um, going back also to this issue of women being blasphemous if they're defending their rights. Um, do, you, do you see that link, Nuria? Um, and also, uh, what do you think about this accusation of Islamophobia as well? Because I just read something, it, well, it was in another language, so I just got to see the title, but something about um, Nadia Murad, who's the Yazidi survivor, being accused of being Islamophobic and prevented from speaking somewhere because of her Okay. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's, uh, it wasn't in English, so I didn't get to read it. Uh, but that link, I think, is always there, and that accusation as well. Yeah, genuinely, I, I, I think you're right in the sense that that Islamophobia term is just constantly lingering over our heads now, even when we speak. And um, it's interesting that you made the link earlier between women who have actually come from an Islamic background and women who have just kind of been dealt uh, Islam through, you know, by virtue of their circumstances and have had it really bad because I think the people who have gone through it by living through Islam themselves are already kind of, we have enough ammunition and we're almost like angry enough at what Islam does to women that we can only empathize with women who have had that as almost secondhand or binary treatment because of their country or whatever their circumstances are. But Again, I think that word is just used as a politicized tool to, you know, to silence us because mm -hmm. if we actually talk about a phobia as, a, as an actual acute imminent fear, then the things that Islam proclaims as a doctrine, we could actually say are genuine things that we, we fear because women under Islam, if you want to look at you know, countries like Iran and Afghanistan, this is what religious theocracy does to a country. This is how it plays mm -hmm. out. Um, but I think in terms of what you're saying about blasphemy and women's rights, the reason it came to light for me that they are honestly inextricably linked. Mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, I think blasphemy should be you know, a, a human right in general, so it should naturally extend to women. Um, second, second of all, I think that by or wanting to defend women's rights or even just asking for women to be treated equally to men in 2021, we're not even talking about you know, kind of like uh, insane radical feminists here. We're just saying, let's be on an equal footing. You must call out the root of what the hell it is that's stopping that. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we need to blaspheme in order to do that, and so be it. <clears throat> but the problem here is that we're trying to, and that's what I will always be insanely grateful for you to, for, Mariam, is because I saw you as one of the first role models that I could look, look up to as a woman. There were hardly any of us who were actually going to universities and taking on almost these goons, like these Islamic goons, and you were saying, well, Sharia prescribes A, B, and C for women. Like, this is something that we need to turn the spotlight on. And many people, like, even today when I do podcasts and I'm talking to other UK atheists or whoever they are, they're scared to mimic the same views that I have of Islam. Uh, because they're scared of being called racist or bigoted or Islamophobic. Whereas I maybe have a privilege card because I'm like, I'm from that community, so you can't really call me a racist. I'm brown myself. Like, it's not really a thing here. But self hating. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or like, I'm here to please my white masters or whatever it is. Yeah, sure, guys. I'm getting paid by all of these people. But. <laughs> 
we are calling it out where, where it is. And, and thirdly, as I mentioned earlier, I think it just irks them that little bit more that, you know, maybe one woman getting through to maybe two women or three women or just planting seeds of doubt is going to be a catalyst for change and there will be a domino effect because it is known that if you have somebody in your family that's completely 360 on their way of thinking, I mean, my, my own views naturally rub off onto my siblings and that's out of my control. It's just, it's a natural phenomenon that happens within the family. But to an outsider, that's the Islamic cultural family values disintegrating. To me, it's beautiful, yeah. what I'm seeing. <laughs> <laughs> but to them, it's beautiful. I think let's open it up to uh, any comments, questions you might have for the panelists or just any comments. Um, so I was just watching the film with a bit of a Muslim hat on, and I thought, you know, one of the challenges we get often as Muslims is, well, you only left Islam because your family is dysfunctional. Yeah? That's nothing to do with Islam, so if you look at the story of Faye, a lot of what she was articulating, you know, the Quran doesn't say anything about even the daughter has this conflict in the floor. It's, it's not how True. it's um, described. So I often find that challenge comes back, mm. and I'm wondering. One, what your thoughts are about the legitimacy of that? <coughs> you know, we'll leave it, are you leaving because um, you had a bad experience because of your dysfunctional family? Uh, and two, how you might respond to that annotation? To any of you? Let me just get two more questions, comments, and then you can respond. Did you have. Uh, yes, uh, my question is in two parts, really. Um, as, well, first of all, as ex Muslim men, what can we do uh, to help? and Secondly, what can we do to help empower uh, girls and women who, um, I think someone on the panel said, are on the verge of uh, leaving Islam and having thoughts about um, or, or questioning their religion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you want to just go ahead to whoever would like to respond to? If I'd just like to address uh, the first portion of your question, <coughs> in terms of Faye's story, for example, like I had the exact same thoughts that you did during the movie at that point where I was like, okay, here I can kind of bridge the line between that being Islamic and this, this just being like a father who's really kind of like, you know, taken power and, and stuff to a next level and none of this is Islamically sanctioned. So I started seeing her story kind of outside of the dogma of Islam at that point because I would even think that Islam would never sanction my dad to like treat me in the same manner, for example. Um, but again, where you just saw the kind of, the, it, it's just more like the inherent, when she talks about the indoctrination that has been there since almost like, you know, the day she was born. And that's what was eating her alive until the day that she reported him was kind of the bit that I could empathize with because even now when I say like, oh, okay, it rubs off onto a family, like me saying my truth and speaking my truth is something that they will have to be okay with because my dad is not on the same level as Faye's dad, for example. It's not like Salafi like that at all, but he would also, he's not gonna ever like stand up and give me applause like the gentleman over there just did earlier for saying what it is I say because I'm actually going against everything they know to be true. So those feelings that she's gone through, through the indoctrination is entirely what I empathize with throughout the movie, even though some aspects of it, as you said rightly, were just a dysfunctional family playing out, which I think we all come from somewhat dysfunctional families. But again, you're completely right, because Islam should only be uh, turned like you know turned into the focal point when it is a problem and at that point I think there are certain things her dad did what which obviously are not Islamically sanctioned but it's more her feelings and her emotions and her lack of wanting to report him until the last minute and all of that which kind of comes from everything she was told as a woman what Islam tells you to be is kind of where I thought that if she had been empowered let's say from the get-go she would have handled things a lot more differently um, but I hope I, I hope that answers that bit at least. Um, I think some of the people in the video did mention the word of uh, conditional love. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is, I think, something that they all experience in terms of, yeah, you can have the physical violence, but there is this underlying thing that sometimes it's not been spoken. You know you have to behave in a certain way because of your religion. There are certain things you cannot do because of your religion. If you do those things, it's unacceptable. So I think that is throughout their development there. In Faye's case, 
uh, what was she doing looking after the young children at her age? Why was she doing that? Okay, we might say that, okay, yeah, it can happen in lots of families, but there was a lot of control. She didn't have the capacity to question anything. It was only when she left that, uh, um, uh, I don't know the full story of what happened later, but uh, when it comes to religion, you know because there are certain unspoken rules there. I mean, I also think uh, there's always um, there's always an excuse given. You know, if you you haven't faced violence, then it's because you don't know Islam well enough. You haven't read it well enough. There's always, I think, they're always looking for a reason to explain why you were never a real Muslim to begin with, or the problems you face are cultural. But that's never a condition when they count all these people as Muslims. You know, they don't say these are all Muslims. Uh, because they've all read the Quran. Now, anyone's a Muslim who's got the Muslim label on them. No questions asked. The minute you say you're ex-Muslim, there are a lot of questions related to it. And I think, again, that comes to the sort of pressures that are involved in um, trying to prevent people from leaving, to humiliate them, to, uh, to limit them, to censor them. And I think we shouldn't buy into those excuses, you know. Uh, because as Sabine said, uh, that might not be what everyone's experience is, for example, violence. But I think violence is often uh, actually um, justified in, in the Quran uh, for those who are disobedient and, and for disobedient women, you know. And um, so, and I think people do use religion as a way of um, excusing violence as well in many, many situations. Well, I, I was just going to try and address your point about how, as uh, ex-Muslim men, you can support women. I think I think you need to raise your voices uh, and you need to challenge those traditions because a man challenging those traditions because of the double standards that we live with <coughs> is always more powerful in some ways than women challenging because it's very easy to dismiss women as you know prostitutes or you know all the kind of slurs that come to you your way because you have rejected the whole way of living and thinking, whereas men are granted a certain degree of leeway, a little bit of rationality perhaps, or maybe even they think you have lost your way, but as a man you can, you know, sort of challenge things. So I would think that's, that's one of the ways in which you could... But I also wanted to just, I mean, slightly, slightly off topic, but, um, you know, this is, and it sort of uh, came up with something that Faye was saying, about, which I find fascinating, that thing about she wanted to adopt the niqab as a way of being an identity marker, except that the niqab invisibilizes you. Mm -hmm. And I find that a fascinating uh, way of looking at this because um, a lot of young women, you know, Muslim women who in this country will have, <coughs> maybe their mothers never wore the hijab mm -hmm. and they've adopted the hijab as, in, as a um, response to the racism of this society. And I just find that interesting as well, that you would choose your, you would prioritize your racial and religious identity over your gender identity. So you disappear as a woman behind the hijab, behind the niqab, behind the burqa, in order to stand out proudly as a Muslim because the society is racist. I find just I find that as well uh, an interesting phenomenon. But anyway, that's slightly off topic. For me, in that kind of phase, uh, I think there was something else as well for her, where um, there is the ideal self, what is expected within that community, mm -hmm. and uh, in order to meet that that expectation, that kind of because of the real self inside gets lost, mm -hmm. and then we have a big gap. There. So then we have that gap between what you expected by your family and your community versus who I really I am. And when you're fighting between those two, covering up, going to the extreme is some way to also suppress mm -hmm. your own individuality. Mm -hmm. Because you're marching, it kind of works the opposite way. And just to kind of like, uh, <coughs> kind of, uh, again, just focus on what you were saying, and in terms of phase experience, maybe I can empathize with her in the sense that I did the same thing, the exact same thing at nine years old. Like I wore hijab and I thought this was the best way to kind of mark my identity. I felt so proud, like 
walking down the street or representing Islam during religious education classes at nine years old. And like, I wasn't able to, you know, climb climbing frames or play football in the way that I would have wanted to. But I put that as like my primary motive without anybody really even kind of forcing it down my throat. But it just seemed to take precedence. Like, it, because of everything else, like the heavy handedness of Islam, it's not just this is what's required of you and this is what a good woman does. It's like this is the path to heaven. I was more shocked that other women around me weren't doing this. I was like, are you guys okay? Like, do you You're not want to go, go to heaven? heaven. <laughs> yeah, I, I was really shocked. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, it's the end of our um, session. It's nine o'clock, but we can all go to the pub if people are at the I'm still uh, yeah, I want to thank our gorgeous speakers.